What a wonderful, beautiful day it is to come and worship. Boy, these guys look like they're having too much fun, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. I tell you, that is a beautiful drum set back here. I'm telling you, just absolutely beautiful. Coming from an old drummer, my drum set was black, all right? And that thing is absolutely beautiful. We appreciate all the work they do. Listen, they take, it takes a lot of time to get this thing together and to make it happen. And boy, do we ever appreciate them. Listen, look in your bulletin right now. There's a lot of stuff in your bulletin. I want to talk to you about it just a bit. Look in your bulletin, and in your bulletin, there is a card that looks like this. Would you please right now just take that card, put your name, your address, your telephone number on the card, and uh, your, the room for your email. Then we can communicate with you on what's happening in the life of the church. Uh, many of you share with us prayer requests. We pray about those requests every week, so be sure to put your prayer request on the card if you would please. Now listen, while you've got the card out, just hold the card in one hand. I think you can handle this. Hold the card in one hand, take this gray piece of paper in another hand. We're getting ready to have here at the church a kid's Easter yard party. It will be on Saturday, April 20, from 4.30 to 6 p.m., we're going to have a great time. You've got a handout in your bulletin that you can give out to kids that you run into, uh, to your grandkids, to whoever. We're just looking forward to a great time. It is going to be so much fun for kids <laughs> and for adults, by the way, all right? And I uh, want you to read all about that and, and plan to be here for that. Uh, but listen, we need your help now. This is the gray sheet. If you would just quickly read through that gray sheet like for example we need four canopy tents you know those are the tents you use at beaches right and we need four of those uh, we need uh, one camping tent we need two large containers of hand sanitizers we need four packages of wipes well anyway there are so many needs that we have and so many ways that you can help now here's what we'd like for you to do today got both of these in your hand right Take the pen from in front of your, uh, take your pen there from in front of your chair and just write down, uh, with your name on it of course, what you can bring. Like if you can bring a canopy tent, write it down. We'll get in touch with you about it to help us in that way. Or if you'd like to help at the registration table, then write that down and that'll help us get ready for this thing. Just write it right down there at the bottom of your, uh, of your communication card. Thank you so much for helping us in that way. And then also there in your bulletin, you have this green piece of paper, okay? Green for what? For grass, right? And this is a kid's Easter yard party, okay? So uh, take this, give it out to kids that you come into contact with, and that'll be a wonderful, wonderful experience. Would you do that? We appreciate it. Also in your bulletin today, you have some little cards that look like this. Uh, Easter is the most important day of the year for the Christian. And there are so many people who are going to church on Easter, and this is an opportunity for you to invite them. So if you would just take one of these cards, maybe just pass them out to a couple neighbors in your community, uh, just whatever, people that you meet, just take these cards. We've got these. We've got more outside there if you need some more. And we'll have more next week. But just take these cards and hand them out so that people will come to New Hope on Easter. They're going to go to church somewhere. And, boy, we'd love to have them in New Hope, wouldn't we? So, so take that opportunity if you would. Now, I want to remind our men, our men's prayer breakfast is this Saturday, uh, April 13th, 8 a.m. here in the Fellowship Hall. Jerry Thompson is going to be speaking uh, for, for our men's uh, breakfast, and uh, you'll want to be a part of that. Let's get a picture on the slide here, if we could. Folks, let me tell you something. We have had uh, an honor bestowed on one of our young people that only happens to 4% of the scouts in the United States. And that is David Holroyd. David, come up, would you? <laughs> so proud of this guy. David has received the Eagle Scout Award. Uh, in Scouts. Congratulations, man. We are so proud of you as a church. 
We're proud of your faith and proud of your service to your community. And boy, does he ever make a difference. And we have a certificate. You may want to corner him and just ask for this certificate. A lot of information on here about, uh, about being an Eagle Scout. We're so proud of him. God bless you, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, great. Well, this is the season where we begin to prepare for Easter. We look to the cross and we look to the resurrection. We're so thankful for Jesus. Again, we're so glad that you are here. Would you join with me and pray? Lord God, how you bless us, how you care for us. You walk with us, God. Father, we thank you for that. This day, we look back to the cross. We look ahead to the resurrection. We're so very thankful that, uh, that there is that salvation that comes through the cross, and there is that hope that comes through the resurrection. And so whatever our situation today, we can trust in you in all things. We know that you are with us. You are with us every day. You're with us. Thank you for walking with us this day. We trust you in all ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last place seldom becomes first place. But in the story of Derek Redmond, the last place runner in the Olympics became first in the minds and the hearts of the fans. Reminds me of a scripture text in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And Jesus said it best in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verse 16. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. For many years, I was blessed to attend a preaching conference. This preaching conference was attended through the years by thousands of ministers, the unusual thing about the preaching conference was not, that it was not in a big city. Instead, it was held in Ingraham, Illinois. I mean, the smallest of burgs. I even knew where Ingraham, Illinois was, and I could still hardly find it. That's Ingraham, Illinois. The minister of that church, Ron Payne, served in that congregation for 40 years. He had an outstanding ministry in that congregation. But the most important thing that he did was that ministers conference held every single year. And these ministers would come to Ingraham and many of them would be broken. They would be tired. They felt like they were last place. But somehow Ron Payne taught them the importance of that verse. So the last will be first and the first will be last. And Ron Payne served that congregation all those years, a congregation that averaged under 100 in attendance. But he did it faithfully, and he knew the importance of that principle. Several years ago, a church called 
Barbara and me and ask us to attend the last service of that congregation. The church was closing. I don't mind telling you I never want to attend a church closing again. If I'm requested to attend a church closing, I'll probably turn it down. It was so much like a funeral service. But when I think of the ministry of that church and the elders of that church and the ministers of that church and the way they served through the years and the people who were reached for the cause of Jesus Christ and the baptisms and the fact that that church was sold and was sold under, way under its value to a congregation of African Americans and now in that place there is an African American congregation reaching African Americans in that community and I suddenly realized that even though the church closed and the last service was so much like a funeral that principle is still true the last will be first and the first will be last last year was the last session of the North American Christian Convention. For 50 years, Barbara and I have attended the North American Christian Convention. I already know that many ministers are thinking this summer, what on earth are we going to do? We can't attend the North American Christian Convention. But something very rare happened with the North American Christian Convention. It gave birth to a new conference and that new conference is called Spire. Now what is Spire? Well, think about it. In every town and city in this country, there is a spire over the church buildings looking over that community and those churches are there to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the new conference is for church leaders. It will be in Orlando and it will be in October. And the whole idea is to reach those for the cause of Jesus Christ. And the last will be first and the first will be last. Today we're looking at our scripture text. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, if you're turning your Bibles to that text. And when we look at Luke, the 22nd chapter, we are looking back at the cross. And the scripture says it best in Luke 22, in verse 2, they were looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. Now all the times that I've read Luke 22, this week, that little phrase just jumped out at me. They were looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. And then I think of this, that throughout history, through the tough times, through the difficult times, people have looked for ways to get rid of Jesus. And we have a tough time understanding that the last will be first and the least will be the greatest and this story in Luke, the 22nd chapter, is made up of various groups of people, Jewish people, none of whom really got along. They were all a part of the same religion, but they didn't agree with each other. They didn't like each other, but they come together for one cause and one cause only, and that one cause is simply to get rid of Jesus. And we look at the passage, and the passage talks about the chief priest. These chief priests were appointed by the government. They were appointed for a one-year term, and then they were off. Let me tell you what they did during their one year. They made as much money off of God's people as possible. That's exactly what they did. You see, their business was the selling of animals for sacrifice. So the people could come and they could sacrifice those animals so that their sins would be forgiven for one more year. And listen to what the chief priest had to say in verse 5. They were delighted to find someone to betray Jesus. And that person was Judas. And so there were the chief priest. And then there were the teachers of the law. The teachers of the law, these were the professors of the law. They had a special understanding of the scriptures and they weren't afraid to share that special understanding. And when they shared the special understanding, it was all about following the law. And if you followed the law, then you were a good Jew. 
But these teachers of the law, they were Sadducees. That's very significant in this scripture text. What on earth is a Sadducee? It's easy to remember. I hope you'll always remember this. Sadducee because you don't believe in the resurrection. And that was the picture of these Sadducees. You see, this scripture looks back at the cross and this scripture looks ahead to the resurrection. It's all about the cross and the resurrection. And these men didn't believe in the resurrection. And then the scripture tells us in Luke 22 verse 4 that there were officers of the temple guard. You see, it was against the law for Roman soldiers to enter into the temple area. These Roman soldiers were considered to be unclean. And so they hired officers for the temple guard. And it was their job to guard the temple area. And then there were the elders of the people. Luke 22, verse 52, it talks about these elders of the people. These elders of the people were the religious leaders of the people. These elders of the people were interested in the spiritual life of the people. Now, I think there's something significant here, and that is this. That word elder, in this particular case, talking about the Jewish people, is the same word elder that's used for elders in the life of the church. Those spiritual leaders of the congregation, in these groups, these people were members of, of a group known as the Sanhedrin. I mean, they were the people that were out in front, the leadership kinds of people. But I want you to notice something about this scripture text. Satan is there. Luke 22, verse 3. Satan is that unseen enemy. And when we look at the cross of Jesus in this whole idea of getting rid of Jesus, listen, We need to remember, whenever we hear people talking about getting rid of Jesus, this is not just a human plot. And it was not a human plot in Jesus' day and time. It was so much more than that. It was a cosmic event of history that was taking place. It was taking place in the unseen world with Satan and his core hearts. And the greatest victory in history for Satan was the day that Jesus died on the cross. And Judas is there. And Judas, the scripture says, is controlled by the devil. And the scripture says, then Satan entered Judas. That word entered is an interesting word. It literally means prompted. The devil prompted Satan. Now, I think that's important. uh, Prompted Judas. I think that's important because it points out that Judas had a choice. He made the decision to turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. This is an active word. It's the idea of throwing something at Judas. And that's the picture. Satan threw this at Judas. And Judas locked onto it. We even use that phrase today. Boy, that was just thrown at me. I didn't see it coming. I didn't expect it. But then it comes. And that's the idea of the word. Satan threw this into his heart. And it's a picture of angry rage. The devil hates Jesus and the devil hates his followers that much that he would throw something at people. And listen, the devil still hates Jesus and the devil still hates his followers. Somebody else is involved in this picture and that is the people, the followers of Christ. This scripture text in Luke 22 makes it clear that the only obstacle, get that now, the only obstacle to these groups who desire above all else to get rid of Jesus are the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's still true that the church prevents evil from prevailing in this world. And so we look back at the cross. And when we look back at the cross, we 
look at a group of people doing everything possible to get rid of Jesus. But then we look ahead to the resurrection. And when we look ahead to the resurrection, we look for ways to celebrate Jesus. We can't forget that all of this text, all of this story takes place during a religious celebration. That religious celebration is already in the works. It is that Passover season that was celebrated by thousands and thousands of Jews. They would travel to Jerusalem to sacrifice the lambs so that the sin could be forgiven for the people for one year. And Jesus emphasized that there is even a greater celebration. Everything that Jesus taught and believed hit in opposition to these Sadducees. These Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection and it hit in opposition of the Pharisees. Jesus talked about grace. He talked about mercy. And they didn't like grace or mercy. And Jesus knew that the cross was before him and he knew about the resurrection and he knew what it all meant. And so Jesus turns to his closest followers and he says, it's time to be prepared. Always be prepared to celebrate what Christ has done. And Jesus turns to his followers and he says, go and prepare. Folks, this is the day of worship. And I want to remind you that worship is all about celebration. This is the Easter season. And Easter is all about the celebration of the resurrection. And just think of some of the things that we can celebrate today. Let me tell you the first thing we need to celebrate. It's our salvation. That's right. Your salvation and your salvation and your salvation and your salvation. My salvation. Did you ever stop to think what you would be without Lord Jesus Christ in your life? Some of you periodically stop me and tell me, Boy, you wouldn't believe the way I would have reacted before I became a Christian. We celebrate our salvation in the fact that God has worked in our lives. We celebrate a changed life. And some of your lives are changed more than others. But listen, all of our lives are changed. We're new and we're different people. All because of the resurrected Christ. And we celebrate that fact. And we celebrate the fact that we're a growing church. We're not a dying church. And we believe with all of our heart that God wants our church to grow. And we celebrate that fact. And we should celebrate that fact. And we celebrate eternal life. Because, folks, we believe in the resurrection. We understand the resurrection that three days later Jesus rose from the dead and we look forward to a resurrection when we will be united in those last days with the Lord Jesus Christ for all of eternity. Folks, we have everything to celebrate, don't we? And this is a celebration. It's okay to clap because we're celebrating, right? And that's exactly what it's all about. Let me remind you, the Lord's Supper has been taken week after week after week after week. It's so wonderful that the Supper is taken by so many people. Think about it. We take the Supper today. Oh, it's not just us. It's so much more. It's people around this city taking the Supper. It's people all around the world, Christians, taking the supper. Some people take the Lord's Supper today and they take the Lord's Supper and they put their life on the line when they take the Lord's Supper. I want to show you a picture this morning. And that is a picture of translation of Scripture. That's a picture from Pioneer Bible Translators. It's a very recent picture. You know, that's one of our missions, Pioneer Bible Translators. And their task is to translate the Scripture into languages of people who have never had the Scripture. 
And this is a picture of portions of Scripture in progress right now. Scripture being translated for people who have never before had the Word of God. Listen, that's something to celebrate. And when we think of that celebration, I want you to think this morning of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people, I don't know, who will begin to partake of the Lord's Supper because they now have the Holy Scripture. You see, it's a celebration. They shared in what is normally called the Last Supper. Now, you know why it's called the Last Supper. It's called the Last Supper because there's a heading in our Bibles that says the Last Supper. I want to suggest something to you. Maybe we should call it the First Supper. See, it was the beginning. It wasn't just the end. It was the whole idea that the last shall be first and the least shall be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And this last supper becomes the first supper. And that supper will continue throughout all of history. And listen to what Jesus said at that first supper in Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God after taking the cup he gave thanks and said take this divide it among you for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes And he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays to me. Yes, I refer to this Last Supper as the First Supper because it truly introduced the resurrection meal. And notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm eager to do this for you. That eagerness. He gives thanks for what God has done, and he shares it. Now, you know all those little pieces of paper that I gave you today? Share with people. That kid's lawn party, Easter lawn party, gave you those pieces of paper to share with kids. Gave you a little piece of paper to share with people about Easter services. Let me tell you why we do that. It's because the message of Jesus Christ is designed first and foremost to be shared. And we share in the Lord's Supper together and we share His message with other people. And the cup is all about something new. The old has passed away. The new has come. And in the past there is the resurrect, uh, there is the crucifixion. And in the future there is the resurrection and new life. And the crucifixion looks to the past and the resurrection looks to a future of hope. We often call this season of Easter the Passion Season. Many of you have probably seen the movie The Passion of Christ. This passion did not catch Jesus by surprise. In so many ways, God was in control. And even to this day, we remember the Passover events. And in the crucifixion, there is forgiveness of sin. And in the resurrection, there is hope for the future. I'm going to ask Keith Stewart to come and prepare us today for the Lord's Supper.
together and share and remember what Jesus did for each one of us. Will you join me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come thanking you. Thanking you for the blessings that we have in Christ. Thanking you, Father, that you were willing to give up your son. Thanking you, Father, that he was willing to take our place and shed his blood. And it's his blood, Father, that cleanses our sin and makes us holy. Help us, Father, to never forget what you did for us. In Christ's name we pray, forever and ever. Amen.